Hello! Welcome to Gospel in Action. In the last video, we have seen who Pharaoh is and how he treated the Israelites before God rescued them. We have also seen that God does not do anything arbitrarily and that he showers mercy on whoever confesses their sins and repents. He even sometimes hardens whoever resists the word of God and rebels against doing his will but only to achieve a greater purpose. In this video, Paul continues to explain to Romans that God does not do anything randomly. He also explains to them on how God works with respect to salvation of individuals in a potter and clay analogy. Let us look at verse 19. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who can resist his will? Paul continues his defense for God from verse 18. So now, someone may question God like this. Why did God put Pharaoh in such a situation that he would resist his will? Is God not unjust in doing that? So, if God does everything by his wisdom and foreknowledge, why does he even find fault with us for resisting him. It is God's fault that he made us like this. Moreover, he always knew that we would resist him and if he plans to do something, he does it anyway. So who can stop God and who can resist his will? We see such rhetorical questions being asked in Paul's letters. It is typical of Paul to assume his audience's questions and answer them. The reason the reason why he asked this question is because he knew that the most sinful people would blame God for their sins as he has made them the way they are. These people try to evade their responsibility saying that if God has everything predetermined, there is nothing that they need to do. That is why the idea of predetermination is such a fatalistic idea. Remember that this is in in the context of Paul explaining to the Romans that God hardened the hearts of the rebellious Israel. The same analogy is being applied to many unbelievers today, saying that if God chose certain individuals for salvation already, then what have I to do? It is anyway not in my control and hence I will continue to live as I want, satisfying my fleshly desires. They have a completely wrong understanding of what God hardening people means. God kept Israel from recognizing their own Messiah and hence kept them from understanding the truth that he spoke as he spoke in parables. So it never meant that unbelievers of today have no responsibility. The truth of the matter is that man's responsibility or man's free will is not a separate thing that we can even compare against God's sovereignty. Man's responsibility is included or comes under the umbrella of God's sovereignty. We cannot separate both. Anyway, let us investigate on how Paul responded to this question. Let us look at verse 20. But who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Will what is molded say to his molder, why have have you made me like this? Paul questions such people back saying, who do you think you are? Do you think you are God's equal to answer him back? Paul is not reprimanding them in vain. There are real people as we witness in our everyday lives who are angry with God because of perceived issues like God didn't allow this or God allowed that or God caused that etc. They are mad at God because things may not have happened according to their limited perception. Whatever may be the case, they 
cannot question God who is their own creator like that. They cannot ask God, why have you made me like this? All of us may humble ourselves and genuinely ask him anything, but not in arrogance. As if we know more than God. We are the clay and God is God. We have been molded by him to be this perfect creation of his. So our creator's judgments are perfect. So the truth that I believe is that we are like this because of our own decisions and actions. Today, those who are not at peace with God and those who are not having the joy in their lives always and those who are not content in their lives, they are like that because of their own choices. The good news, however, is that all that can change in their lives. If you are that person, you are are one decision away to make your life complete. So come, come to Jesus. Your life will be changed for good. If we are in Christ, we will have the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of us through whom we can choose to be joyful always and choose to be content in every situation. The power of sin will no longer be upon us. Anyway, the conclusion is that there is no place for attack or arguing against God because God is God, a perfect judge. We must be humble in every aspect before God. He does everything in perfect love and perfect justice. We don't need to doubt that one bit because if we read the passage, clearly God's hardening is not arbitrary. The passage implied that God showers mercy on people because of their obedience obedience and on some occasions hardens them because of their rebellion. So God sometimes does harden people because of their evil works to achieve a greater purpose. God knows everything. He is omniscient. Now with this understanding let us get into Paul's potter and clay analogy in verse 21 to understand more on how God works with respect to the salvation of individuals. Verse 21. Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? Paul is quoting this from Jeremiah chapter 18 and verse 6 which says, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter has done? Declares the Lord. Behold, like the clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. Paul's audience knew the context the moment he mentioned the potter and clay. The context before this verse that is in verse 4 was that the clay was spoiled in the potter's hand and so he reworked it into another vessel for dishonorable use. That is not what the clay was originally intended to be used for. But as most people in today's day are not familiar with the Old Testament and have loads of presuppositions. They could not see things clearly and so they are being stumbled. When Paul asks, has the potter no right over the clay? He did not mean that God is a monstrous God displaying some sort of tyranny who can do whatever he wants. There is a reason why God does things the way he does, satisfying both his love and justice. In this case, the clay was spoiled which directly implies that Israel turned away from God and did evil things. So now let us see what God has to say to them in verses 7 through 10. If at any time I declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will pluck up and break down and destroy it and if that nation concerning which I have spoken turns from its evil I will relent of the disaster that I intended to do to it. And 
and if at any time I declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will build and plant it and if it does evil in my sight not listening to my voice then I will relent of my good that I had intended to do to it. In short God says this to all nations that although the consequence for turning away from me and doing evil things is destruction I will show mercy and relent of the disaster that I intended to do to you if you repent and turn from your evil ways and follow me and likewise as in the case of Israel God says I will relent of the good that I intended to do if the nation rebels and does evil in my sight even after I promise to build it and plant it. So God initially intended Israel to be used as a vessel for honorable use. That is, he chose Israel for a very specific purpose. And that purpose or service was to know God and reveal this good God to the rest of the world. But we know that Israel as a nation messed up this opportunity. So as this vessel was spoiled, God turned it into a vessel for dishonorable use. Likewise, God would have showed mercy on the Pharaoh of Egypt and relent the disaster intended for him and his people. If he gave in to the demand of God of letting the people of Israel go. But he chose to harden his own heart and brought disaster upon himself and his nation. So now let me ask you, does the potter have the right over the clay? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely, he has the right to make out of the same lump a vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use. But it is dependent only on their responses to God's call on their lives. Likewise, he has the right to show mercy and forgive our sins when we repent and put our trust in Christ. And then he transforms us to be the vessel cells for honorable use that is of worshiping him forever and he has the right to harden certain individuals and leave them for dishonorable use that is for them to die in their own sins if they continue to be rebellious to the loving call of God on their lives all this because our God is also the God of justice he is impartial and holds the justice justice of the highest order. So what category of people or group do we want to be part of? Do we want to be part of the vessels of honorable use or the vessels of dishonorable use? Yes, we can choose. We have the free will which is uncorrupted. Paul confirms this again in 2 Timothy chapter 2 verses 20 and 21 where he says, now in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver but also of wood and clay some for honorable use some for dishonorable therefore if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable he will be a vessel for honorable use set apart as holy useful to the master of the house ready for every good work in short Paul appeals to everyone that in God's great house there are vessels for honorable use and others for dishonorable use like we described earlier. Now, how can anyone become a vessel for honorable use? If anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will become a vessel for honorable use. Here cleansing is being born of water and of the spirit as mentioned in John chapter 3 verse 5, which means to be cleansed completely from our sins and be filled and be sealed with his holy.
Holy Spirit that is through our faith in the finished work of Christ on the cross. When we cleanse ourselves by our faith, we will be set apart as holy, useful to God and be ready for every good work. Make no mistake here, it was God who initiated the process of salvation and then we believed. He loved us so much that he gave his only begotten son to die on the cross in our place that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. This is according to John chapter 3 and verse 16. Let us break this video here and when we come back we will investigate whether God gives enough chances and be patient with the vessels of dishonorable use before destroying them or not. Until then, please stay tuned to Gospel in Action and to know more about me, please find the link to my testimony and contact details in the description below. Thank you again for watching.